Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Okay, sorry. We. Uh, good afternoon, IS. Good afternoon. I mean, yes. Good afternoon, Isabella. Hello, Rachel. Good afternoon, Cynthia. Hello, Melissa. Oh, people are coming. I'm. Uh, hello, Aaliyah. Hang on. Pardon me. Hello. Whoa. All right. I think. Thank you. And right back at you. I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna keep going. I'm right. Okay. Uh, wait, there's more people. Oh, and I have an observation. Okay, we're gonna start. What's happening? Hold on. Uh, I'm totally rattled. But hello, Amanda. Uh, okay, wait, I'm gonna fix the lighting. Um, yes, hello, hello, I think that's it. Yes, hello, Amanda, awesome. Hello, Miles, if I didn't say. Um, okay, we are gonna get rolling in a second. We, I'm gonna mostly skip logistics and just get, there's, you got, now I owe you guys stuff again, like you got stuff to me last night. Thank you, I haven't gotten it back yet. Um, I still have to set people up, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. Um, quick thing. Okay, um, stupid joke I heard the other night. Uh, 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 Neutron walks toward a bar and sees there's a, a sign that says special martinis five dollars tonight. Neutron walks in and says, "Oh, I hear martinis are five dollars tonight. Can I have a martini?" And the bartender says, "Yes, that's right, but for you, Neutron, no charge." Okay, that's totally stupid. Um, uh, okay, wait, is here? All right. Um, also, I want you to know something. Oh, wait, hello, uh, wait. Oh, you can hear me, yes? Or something? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, also, uh, wait. Okay. Another stupid joke like that, just also because I one just got cut off. Uh, another stupid joke like that that I heard. I don't know why I'm hearing these jokes, but um, uh, uh, an enormous bear walks into a bar, um, and the bartender says, "Yeah, what can I get you?" And the enormous bear says, "I'll have uh, Jack Daniels and uh, pretzels." And the bartender goes, "Okay, Jack Daniels and pretzels. Uh, why the long pause?" And the bear and the bear says, "I don't know. I was born that way." Um, uh, get it, pause. Okay, anyway, whatever. Um, uh, and you get it. Okay, oh, yes, you can hear me, not yes, you can get the joke. Okay, cool, yes. Um, oh, there's more people. Sorry, okay. Oh, good. I'm glad you can hear me, although all you would have heard are easy stuff. Um, and I think maybe, hang on, I think. Still people coming, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, pardon me for a second. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Come. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Sorry. Oh, cha, 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 cha. oh, good afternoon, Farina. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. And, and hello to everybody. And I'll say a quick observation too. Again, I want to get, uh, I want to get back to this wave stuff today. Um, I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I want to go back to the weird stuff. One thing, I just to your credit, I, just, I noticed this. Um, it kind of finally hit me. You know, this whole business with like saying hello to each one of you and each one of you says hello, which I really do appreciate. And I really, somehow it does make it more human for me. But I'm noticing now that like each time I get to each of your names now, I, I stutter and spaz out like more and more each time. And my, 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 my monkey mind like jumps around more and more with each name because, but here, which is embarrassing and everything and waste time. But it finally hit me why that's happening because with each one of your names now, more and more, there are specific, oh, someone's here, excuse me, speaking of which. Uh, but with each one of your names, like more and more specific thoughts go through my mind about you, whoever you are in particular, like, oh, I owe that person this, or, oh, that person said this thing the other day, I want it. Like, and with each person, I suddenly have like a pause where I want to say something to that person, or it makes me, which just goes to show that each one of you really increasingly has made yourself known unto me as an actual human being who's not just like a number in a Zoom call. And that's to your credit. Like, I just, just want to say, I appreciate that. Like somehow, you know, this whole, oh, well, no, 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 wait, wait, no, 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 for real. Like, okay, someone just put something funny in the direct chat, but no, like it, 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 it it's a different thing with each person. Wait, no. <laughs> All right, I don't even, I don't even know how to respond to what I just saw in the chat. But no, like for real, I'm saying like. But I do feel like I know who each one of you is better and better. At least, no, 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 for real. Like and 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 for real. Like okay, what's even happening right now in the direct chat, which I can't is an example. Like, like again, like I said yesterday. There, first of all, there's no such thing as off topic questions because at worst if they're really off topic and I really can't deal or shouldn't deal then it's my job to say I can't answer that right now but you know for any one of you to be putting anything ever in the chat or in the public or whatever it just is all the more like you're here you're engaged you're trying to get something out of it like and I and you know the more and more hard I think all of this is and the more tiresome this all gets I mean this whole world of COVID like the more I just want you all to know like I'm beginning to or not begin, I really actually feel like I have a concept in my mind of who many of you are. And of course, I'm sure my concept is completely wrong, but I mean, make no mistake, but at least there's a concept, right? And and partly this is because what a lot of you have done with those game assignments, like even in your one sentence, like just based on your font or your handwriting, or you're like, whatever, like it starts to carve out some sort of like personal distinction for you, which like is a good thing in life, I think, um, or at least it, it makes my life more bearable. So anyway, so thank you. And um, and there's nothing for any of you to apologize for really, um, unless you're secretly trying to tell me something that I should be apologizing for when you do, but whatever, whatever. Um, but anyway, I just wanna say that. So also, um, so I wanna to get to this wave business today. Uh, or I mean, I wanna to get to a specific thing about ways today. Um, that's based on what we've been doing. Like we, yes, yeah, so, so we derived the wave equation Then we started analyzing what the wave equation means. Now I want to extract a very important implication from the wave equation of speaking with uh, an implication regarding uh, wave velocity or wave speed, speaking of which, here we go, right. Um, so like there is something very specific and a very specific sort of punchline that I want to get to today um, regarding the speed of a wave. Um, but I also, and I think it's an exciting conclusion, but I also want to be more concrete and let you know that the conclusion I want to get to today about wave speed or about the speed of a wave in general is a conclusion that is um, important unto itself, but also super relevant and important and necessary and helpful to any analysis that one might ever do of the Doppler effect which I think I've mentioned is one of my favorite topics. And here's the thing, the Doppler effect, just to be super clear now, if I can, I am under the impression that you've at least begun to investigate the Doppler effect with Professor Kim, or perhaps even better that I'm under the impression that he really walked very thoroughly through two out of the four cases, or, and if I'm wrong about that, that means he's about to. But my impression is that Professor Wu got into some great detail uh, and maybe even made you sit through a, a tremendous amount of detail about the Doppler effect. So here's the thing, which is great because the Doppler effect is near and dear to our hearts. It's a very important part of this course. 
So what I'm about to say, I mean as good news, I don't, it, I hope it's not meant to be a scary thing or anything, but because he either has spent so much time on the Doppler effect or is about to spend so much time on the Doppler effect with you. And because, you know, he did details uh, thoroughly on the one end, I'm not going to repeat the exact details he did, but I'm going to try in my way to you make sense out of the Doppler effect from another angle, i.e. you will have ended up spending a great deal of your lives talking about the Doppler effect between him and me. And so just one thing I want to make clear, because this is not always true every semester, there will definitely be a Doppler effect problem on the final exam. I mean, the final exam is again going to be a take home. It'll have like three big problems on it, whatever. One big chunk of those problems will be a Doppler effect problem. Another big chunk also, just so you know, will be a circuit thing, which is like the other thing he's going to end up spending a lot of time on. This is all to say, um, we really want your lab experience and your lecture experience to be uh, like reinforcing each other, not like putting you in conflict or wasting your time. So all this stuff that you're doing with him, again, I'm going to try to cover it from a different angle and make a different perspective out of it, but it is definitely on the final. So he's not just spinning your wheels. And the reason I keep alluding to what I think he's just done or about to do is just to be honest or whatever, I actually was on the phone with, I had the pleasure of being on the phone with Professor Wu for four hours last night. We had a lot of catching up to do. I missed the man dearly. Um, so we really did talk a lot about exactly what we think is going on. I'm sure what you think is going on might not be the same as what we think is going on, but you know, we really are committed to the idea that we should not be pulling you apart. We should be putting you together. So we, the Doppler effect will be on the final. And I, if you can't find your note, like the, and the notes that he gave you or the whatever he provides, let me know and he's going to resend it to me and I'll put him in the Google Classroom. But like, and today, the punchline of today will hopefully at least uh, underlie or undergird whatever it is you're saying about the Doppler effect with him. All right, so, so that's all of that. Um, uh, yeah, I do miss Professor Wu. Um, okay, um, and I hope you do too when you don't see him four days a week. Okay, all right. So that's all of that. So now I, I want to talk about waves. Um, again, uh, so what I'm going to do is going to get you to the Doppler effect. Don't expect it won't, it won't immediately click at the beginning. But um, where I think we left off in this class, Remember we did that and then we did that and oh yeah, that was fun. And then that thing happened. Oh yeah. And then, oh, I said that. And then we used the color red. Oh yeah. And then we changed handwriting. Remember that? Oh yeah. And then free body diagrams. Oh, which I still have to go over again with you, but I won't do today. But thank you for reminding me, whoever did. Um, and then, oh yeah, small angle approximation. Don't you love that? Oh, and this brings back memories of that romantic thing when we were like, okay, oh, acceleration. Oh, some of my best friends rhyme with this acceleration. Okay. And then this happened, the definition. Of, uh, I'm just trying to get to where exactly we were at. Um, okay, so right, I talked a lot about this yesterday, right? We have um, the wave equation, but now we're going to slow down. Like, you know, hopefully we're getting used to it. Our big point these days is the wave equation. Again, it, you're, so I want you to think of it as um, a higher dimensional, ex, a higher dimensional expansion or extrapolation or implication of simple harmonic oscillation, right? They're both differential equations. They're both second order differential equations, but one is about time and this one's about time and space. Okay, but we said a big thing about that yesterday, uh, Monday. Um, then I think, now I'm gonna need your help. I mean, you, meaning the class, like meaning whoever, because I know I got to slightly different places in the two sections on Monday. What I believe is, did I, did I do, okay, I know you sort of did it in lab three a long time ago, but this page right here, is this something that I said in your class on Monday or is it, I and mean, please be honest, like I just wanna make sure I'm in the right place. Did we, did I take derivatives of, of um, a cosine omega t, or let me back up. Did I remind you on Monday and, and you take a moment to look at your notes or whatever, but on Monday, did we get to this point where I reminded you that one way that we used to look, that we looked at waves um, uh, uh, before we got into this whole uh, pluck thing, like, like the way we, okay, I'm going to back up. I want to remind you that when we first started talking about waves here, and when you first started looking at them in lab three, I had this whole explanation that 
if you took a bunch of oscillators and put them a bunch of identical vertical oscillators and put them next to each other horizontally and staggered them all in phase that you could you could embody that entire collection of phase staggered oscillators in one equation and the equation was this y equals a cosine omega t plus kx and that is now a so that's a collection of phase staggered oscillators this is what i said a couple of weeks ago and then i pointed out i mean that is a function of both time and space now, this I said a couple weeks ago, but did I say, did I remind you of this on Monday? Did we get this far? Uh, could someone tell me, like, is this familiar for Monday or did I stop one second before this? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm dying here. Should I rephrase the question? Could anybody just look at their notes from Monday or can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. Is, is this in your notes from Monday? Could someone tell me? Why am I going? Wait, can you actually hear? Wait, can I get a hello from anybody? Can I hear you guys? We can yeah, hear you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, so now I'm scared. So, does this? Could you? Oh, okay. You feel like okay. I okay. Cool. I appreciate that, Farina. Good. You feel like you've seen it before, and but just to be clear, you definitely have seen it before. I guess my. Oh, and yes. Okay, and you did see it Monday. I did. Okay, and you. But the real question I'm asking right now, and I'm not to put anybody on the spot. I just want to make sure I'm in the right place. Like, did you see it on Monday? Did I mention this like two days ago? Is the question. And you're saying yes. You agree? That's a yes. Okay. All right. And of course, if there's any doubt, I'm going to do it. To what, like, because then, then does this does this look familiar? This is the key question, and it's very. Okay, fair enough. I appreciate your honesty. And again, this is not a test. This is just to make sure I don't like do the. Okay, all right. So this page, for example, this page is not necessarily screaming at you that it's familiar. And right, you don't think this page is familiar, right? And and I wouldn't. And you okay? And I wouldn't be surprised if it's not. Like like, okay. And if there's any doubt, I guess I better just do this. Okay, okay. I think I got my answer. I feel like I'm a little bit pulling teeth here. Um. Uh, Okay, so so let me start at the top. Like this is a collection of phase staggered oscillators. Like that thing that I circled in red at the top, that is one equation that could be used to describe a whole set of identical like masses on springs, let's say. Identical meaning same mass, same spring constant, each one. If you had a whole huge collection of identical vertical oscillators, but you arrange them on a horizontal axis and you arrange them such that, so they, they're identical. So they each have the same omega, like they each vibrate, they each oscillate at the same rate. But if, but if you give each one a different phase constant, right? Like, like, in other words, it, this to go back to what we said a long time ago, and again, if, if suddenly this clicks in, you're like, oh yeah, 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 he totally talked about this Monday. Like if it suddenly strikes you familiar, you could tell me and then I'll move a little bit faster. But but I want you to remember what this equation is supposed to represent is, is like like if, if there was no kx term at all, oh you can't see that. If 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 if, if this right here, imagine for a second. If you just had that equation, that would be all oscillator and plus zero means it has no particular head start or no, no particular delay. Like it's just all oscillator, like from the beginning of the year where we just assume that we start our clock right when that oscillator is displaced to its maximum. Like we start measuring when the oscillators are all pulled all the way to like 15 centimeters from the equilibrium position or, you know, some stretch like that. And we start measuring and then, and then it falls down and then it goes back up to its initial spot and keeps going back and forth. So if that term were zero there, it would mean that we started our clock at, at the everyday sort of obvious uh, place in its cycle where it's as far from equilibrium as possible, right? So that'd be like one oscillator that we're just measuring normally. But we had said a long time ago, if instead we had put something like this, if we put like a term there like pi over two, that would mean that it's just still one oscillator, but it means that we started measuring the time of that oscillator, not when it was at the beginning of the cycle, but when it was like a fourth of the way into its cycle, a fourth. Why do I say a fourth? Because there's two pi radians 
to a cycle. So if I add a little pi over two term here, like pi over two is one fourth of two pi, right? So if I added a little term like pi over two, that would mean that we started measuring when the thing was already like pi over two radians into its cycle, i.e. a fourth of the way into its cycle, meaning we start timing when the thing is already at the equilibrium position. Okay, right? And that, that would be like a separate oscillator. So, and then if we had, say if we had a third oscillator next to it, that was something like this, like, like two pi over two. So the first one had a turn. So the zeroth oscillator, we might have you know, it started at the beginning. And then we have an oscillator right next to it. But when the first one's at the beginning, the next one, let's say, is at equilibrium position. So that's that pi over two thing. Then imagine, and we call that oscillator number one. Then we, we call the first one oscillator zero. Then we call the next one oscillator one. Then if we have oscillator number two that has a two pi over two term on it, that would mean that it's starting a, a half of the way into the cycle. So in other words, this next one's all the way at the amp at the negative a position, like negative 15 centimeters, like 15 centimeters below the equilibrium position or something. So like we could have a bunch of oscillators, each with a different equation describing it, all very similar equations, but each one like different by say, for example, pi over two. Again, this is like technically a review of what we said weeks ago, but I, it's kind of important to revisualize it. If you imagine a bunch of identical oscillators, but that are all like staggered, by some amount in phase, like right here in my example, I'm using the amount pi over two radians, right? You could have all these oscillators and each one of them could be described by its own equation. And each equation would just differ by that constant term there in the parentheses. And you could set up a pattern where like the zeroth oscillator has a plus zero over, uh, has a plus zero times pi over two. Then the first oscillator has like plus one pi over two. The second oscillator has like plus two pi over two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it would have to be a different equation for each oscillator. And that's just all still a bunch of harmonic oscillators. But then if you take one more step in your mind and say, okay, I'm going to arrange them all on a meter stick. I'm going to put the zero with one right at the edge of the meter stick. I'm going to put the first one like one centimeter into the meter stick or one meter in. I'm going to put the second one two meters in. So in other words, you equally space them and each next oscillator you put at a specific X position. And if you maintain this pattern where each next oscillator is differing in phase by a constant amount, then you could, then in your mind, it could be like, oh, so it's cosine omega T plus zero times pi over two, then, then the next one is, is omega t plus one pi over two, then the next one is omega t plus two pi over two, and that zero, that one, that two, what are they? Like th those increments, they're just positions on the x-axis, and, and the pi over two doesn't have to be pi over two. It, oh god, what just happened? Sorry, hold on. Are you still there? Okay, yeah. The pi over two is just an arbitrary example. It could have been pi over... Good heavens, what is my computer? My computer is, is like more ADHD than I am. Hold on a second, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I love when I love when I get a thing from the computer that says your internet connection is unstable. Like, yeah, I mean, so is my emotional life. Like what's new, but okay. Um, uh, uh, so you could, you could set up this whole thing physically with all these oscillators that are all identical, but staggered in phase. And you, but you could summarize the whole thing in one equation. If instead of like, you could capture the whole thing in one equation, as long as instead of pi over two, you recognize it could have been any number, just call it that whatever that number is K. And, and, and um, next to K, you put X standing for how far out you are on the X axis. In other words, this equation that I just wrote now that I've written before, what that is, is a, that's one equation that captures an entire horizontal collection of identical vertical oscillators that are all staggered in phase. So that like one's here while the other's there, while the other's there. So that all of them are going rip, 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 you know, like, like, um, like the fountains in front of the Brooklyn Museum or like a bunch of windshield wipers on a bunch of trucks or something like that. Um, and that's a way to understand a wave pulse is what we said. Again, this is technically review, but just to get it straight, I'm saying that a whole, a whole, wave pulse can be understood as a collection of staggered oscillators. And the collection of staggered oscillators is this function of two variables, x and t, 
right? This function right here. That's what we, and that's a way to understand what a wave pulse is. That's what we said like a month ago or that or something. And that's what you sort of are trying to see why that's true in lab three and lab four. Okay, now what I'm saying, now to sort of get back to the material or what I maybe did or did not do at the end of Monday. Now what I'm saying is, oh wait, we've got a function like this. So this is the, again, this is the, the collection of staggered oscillators way of understanding a wave pulse, right? I'm saying, I'm trying to, I'm taking pains to remind us that this way of talking about waves, this itself has nothing to do with, nothing obvious to do with plucking a string or anything. Like I, for two days, we've been talking about what happens if you pluck a string. And then we got this crazy wave equation from it. Now I'm saying, and again, forgive me if this is redundant. Maybe I did already do this money, but, and, but, but now I'm saying, all right, put that on a shelf. We got this wave equation from a plucked string, but we had already thought we understood waves from this other equation. If we looked at waves as a collection of staggered oscillators. So I'm going back to that now and hoping that I could see a connection between the two or see how this is all related. If I look at the collection of staggered oscillators, it is, an example of a function of two independent variables. We never had that before in math or science. It's a new thing now, a function of both x and t. We now have this new notation and new technique for taking derivatives piece by piece, taking partial taking a function of more than one independent variable and taking looking at rates of change individually of each independent variable. So that, uh, that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to look at derivatives now, kind of like we did back in the day with Hooke's Law. I'm going to look at partial derivatives. So this is what's happening on the page here. I'm going to, first I'm going to look at what's the partial derivative of y with respect to t, that like this first line right here, or the second line on the page. Specifically, I mean, I'm going to look at that equation on the top, y equals a cosine omega t plus kx. And I'm going to just look at how y is changing in relation to t, meaning I'm going to treat everything else, specifically x, I'm going to treat x as a constant for a moment in this operation. Like, please remember again, x is a variable and t is a variable and, they, and they're independent variables. Really meaning in English, like if you're looking at a whole stagger, a whole collection of staggered oscillators and anybody walks in the room and says, hey, how high is this stuff? You would have to say to that person, how high are you for even asking that? Like that doesn't even mean any, no, you wouldn't say that. But you'd say, what do you mean how high? Oh, you mean how high right now? And you mean how high over there? Oh, that I could answer, right? But if you tell me you want to know how high things are right now over there, it's gonna be a different answer because everything's like going like this. And if you ask me how high are things over there, but in a minute, that's gonna be a different answer because things are like, everything's going like this. And right, like that's why you got two different graphs in lab three. So, so, it, so height is dependent on both time and space, but we can ask, okay, what's the rate of change of height with respect to time and when we ask that, when we individually want to look at the partial derivative of y with respect to t, what we're saying is let's for a moment treat x as though it were a constant. Uh, x is not a constant. It's a variable. But we're going to hold it constant for a moment in the math, right? I'm going to take a derivative of, of that a cosine omega t expression. I'm going to take a derivative just like you always do, but I'm going to take it treating t as the variable and pretending like x is a constant. And if I do that, if you look right here, like then if I treat x like it's a constant, then the derivative of kx is zero. Like it's like, what's the derivative of b? Zero, right? But, but uh, the derivative of the whole thing then becomes negative a omega sine omega t plus kx, right? Like I, I did treat t as a variable so much so that I had to do chain rule and bring the omega out like we always do. But I didn't bring a k out of my answer because I'm pretending for a moment that x is constant, right? So then I do it again. I took a, I took a second derivative. I took the derivative of my first result. And again, I'm just treating t as a variable. How do I know that I'm just treating t? Because t is the thing that's in the denominator here. I'm taking partial derivative of y. Or I'm taking now the second partial derivative of y with respect to t. And I get this thing, negative a omega squared cosine 
omega T plus KX, right? Now, one thing before I even go further, you might very, if you aren't following this, and, and please, if you're not, please tell me in the chat, or if I totally already did this and now you realize what I'm talking about, and you're like, no, we, we spent a half hour on this already Monday, can you please go on? You could tell me that too. You could even tell me that privately, because I, I actually do suspect that that might be right. But, but, but more to the point, if you're following this and you think, wait, you're, you're, wait, yeah, about, you're saying X is a variable and you're making a big point how there's two variables, but at the other side of your mouth, you're pretending X is a constant, like, yo, pretend science? What do you mean? Like, why are you allowed to do that? Fair question. But if you think about it, it's exactly what we do in the lab all the time. In fact, it's the whole point of the experiment of the um, scientific method. It's exactly what you did in lab three. In other words, you had, you looked at this big, well, in, in well, yeah, in, in lab three, you looked at this big phenomenon, which is like pulses going back and forth on a string. The height of the string was continuously varying in relation to both what time you looked and where you looked on the string, right? So we have a function of two independent variables, but in lab three, you did a bunch of things. One thing you did was you took a photograph or like a, you know, a frame, you, you looked at one image of the whole string, like you picked one point in time, and then you just made a graph where you took data about how high the string is as a function of X. Like you held, you picked a particular moment in time. In other words, you held the time constant for a moment so that you could tease out or separate out how Y related to X. And then you also picked one spot, one X position, and you watched the movie of the string at that X position. And you got a graph, you got a bunch of data and a graph representing what Y was doing as a function of T holding X constant. Right, you you're not lying. You're just holding something constant so that you can observe some other variation in and of itself. It literally is the point of every experiment you ever do. The whole point of an experiment is you hold a bunch of things. Like if you want to measure the effect of uh, weight on falling objects, if you're like, I wonder if heavier objects like fall faster than light ones. So what do you do? Like you take a bunch of different objects, all of different masses, and you like time each one of them and see how far they fall. And then you make a graph of your results and see what the dependence is. But you deliberately, in order to do that, if you want to see how rate of falling depends on mass of object, you deliberately hold everything else constant. That is to say, you pick a bunch of objects of different mass, but you deliberately make them all the same volume and you make them all the same aerodynamic. Like you don't make one out of paper and one out of feather and one out of gold. And that like totally is too many variables happening at once. You can't separate out the relation you're looking for. The whole point of the scientific method is we hold all things constant except for the one independent variable we want to look at. And we watch how nature responds with one dependent variable. So that's what, so literally taking partial derivatives is the mathematical version of doing the scientific method. Hold everything constant except for the thing you want to look at so that what you're seeing is actually what you think you're seeing and not confused by other stuff. Okay, so we took a partial derivative here uh, with respect to time and then we did it again and we got that the second partial derivative with respect to time of height of y position is negative a omega squared cosine omega t plus kx. Like, okay, no great shake, not a very new looking thing. It looks pretty familiar probably. That's what we got. What's my point? Well, then if we go to the next page, we could not with, and look at that same function, the same phenomenon. Now let's take partial derivatives. I, I think I did do this one day, but someone just tell me honestly if I did this. I'm going to keep going and finish this, but are we sure I did this one? Well, anyway, we, we now, we now, take the same function and just back up. And now we look at partial derivative with respect to X, meaning we're gonna deliberately hold T as a constant. So when you do that, like you chain, you know, you do, the, 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 the derivative of cosine is negative sine, but then you have to do chain rules. So you take out a K because the variable now is X. So uh, we get that partial Y partial X equals negative. I'm, I'm on the second line of the sheet now partial y, partial x equals negative a k sine of omega t plus kx. Then we take the partial derivative again, i.e. take the second derivative, 
Um, and so the K comes out again by chain rule, but we get the cosine, but the negative sign stays. So we get negative A omega squared cosine omega T plus KX. Okay, now we've now taken one expression. We've taken two derivatives, two different ways. We've got the second derivative with respect to time. We've got the second derivative with respect to space. And they each yielded an expression that was very similar. They each yielded an expression that had a cosine omega t plus kx term in it. So what I'm going to do is take each expression and isolate the cosine. Like I'm going to resolve for the cosine. So in other words, uh, like, so, yeah, so like, if we, if we look back, like, if we look, remember, like, so over here, so I'm going back to this page, we got, when we did the time derivatives, we got this third expression on the page. So I can, I'm in effect dividing both sides by negative A omega squared. And so we get right? So I took my time derivative thing and I divided both sides by negative a omega squared. Why? So that I could get cosine by itself. Why did I do that? Because that very same cosine term is in the other expression. That very same cosine term is in, is in here, right? So I then took this expression, divided both sides by by negative a k, omega, uh, k squared, right? So, so now I've got cosine, so now the bottom, whoa, hello. So now at the bottom, I've got cosine omega t plus kx equals messy partial blah, 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 all divided by negative a k squared. It all looks very, very messy perhaps, but what I now have is two different expressions that both equal cosine omega t plus x. That's the point, that's why I'm doing it. I'm, so I can, so they're both equal to cosine, so they must be equal to each other, right? I mean, like if A equals C and A equals B, then B equals C is what I'm saying, if that helps. Um, well, yeah, so here we go. Like cosine equaled blah, blah, blah over negative A K squared, but cosine also apparently equaled the time derivative over negative A omega squared. So I'm gonna set these equal to each other. So now what it looks like I have is I have partial two partial y of r, like the second partial derivative of y with respect to x all over negative a k squared equals the time derivative all over negative a omega squared. So the negative signs cancel out, the a's cancel out. And then I'm gonna, and then I bring the omega squared to the other side and what I end up with, yeah. And I think this is really where I did end Monday but hopefully what I've just said is clarifying or helpful. What we end up with here is the second partial derivative of y with respect to t equals some constant times second partial derivative of y with respect to x. And that should look very familiar because the thing that we spent two days, like the, that, well, sorry. I think I had one second. Yeah, okay. So what I'm saying to summarize then, we spent two days applying Newton's second law to a, a string, to plucking it and seeing what happens. And a, a string of a certain amount of tension, T, and a certain amount of density, mu. And we ended up getting this maybe intimidating looking, but I'm hopefully trying, you know, but this package of information, this second, we, we plucked a string and we got this second order partial differential equation right here, which says in effect that acceleration equals some constant times concavity. I mean, that's what I've now spent all Monday trying to say. Like that equation says acceleration at any and every point 
equals some constant times concavity at any and every point. But now I'm that that's from plucking a string. But then I'm saying, oh, also in a completely independent part of our brain, if we arrange a bunch of oscillators together and try to make a pulse that way, we get a second order differential equation in, that has exactly the same form. It says acceleration equals some constant times concavity. Therefore, number one, it seems to me to reinforce like, whoa, a plucking a string produces the same effect as collecting a bunch of staggered oscillators. Like either way you want to look at it physically, that is a wave pulse. You can make a wave pulse by perturbing a medium, or you can make a wave pulse by arranging a bunch of oscillators. It comes to the same math form equation. But also what I want to say now is, whoa, if we, if they're both saying acceleration equals constant times concavity, and they're both referring to the exact same phenomenon, which is a wave pulse, then it, apparently t over mu is one way of writing a constant and omega squared over k squared is one way of writing a constant, but it better be the same bloody constant if it's the same phenomenon. So apparently these two seemingly unrelated things, t over mu and omega squared over k, k, k squared must actually be equal to each other. Like, yeah, so I'm saying, and this is, so I'm saying, and now, now I am, I think, saying something new. I don't think I said this Monday. I'm saying, remember, something like very similar to this happened when we first analyzed harmonic oscillation. When we, we, Hooke's law said dtx, I mean, d2x over dt squared equals negative k over mx. That's what Hooke's law said. But then our, like, taking derivatives of cosine function, blah, 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 ended up saying d2x over dt squared equals negative omega squared x. So we concluded, like, two months ago, oh, we must be doing something right. We must be describing the same phenomenon the, the same way. But that must mean that K and M are, is one name for a constant and omega squared is just some other name for that same constant. And even though one seems to be about angular frequency and the other seems to be about like spring stiffness and mass, they must ultimately be referring to the same thing. In fact, they must even be measured in the same units we ultimately found out, even though they don't look like they are, they are both in radian square per second squared. In fact, that was on the midterm. Well, the same, so we concluded, oh, omega squared must equal K over M or in other words, omega equals square root of K over M. That's where that came from. Same thing here, same thing here. If we now have two mathematically formally identical expressions for the same phenomenon, again, formally, the same expression, derivative, e certain type of derivative equals constant times other type of derivative. Well, then, then the two ways of writing the constant must be one and the same. Omega squared over k squared must equal t over mu. That's what I'm saying now. That's a conclusion that whatever that constant is, omega squared over k squared must be the same as the constant t over mu. And let me pause to remind you, I'm writing the t in sort of a funny way here. And in fact, I'm writing the k in a funny way because things are getting very murky. Please let me remind you, lowercase t always stands for time, time the independent variable. That's what lowercase t is. We're never going to change that. But now we've got two capital T's flying around in our lives and flying around in the same chapter. They're about to become very interrelated. We've got the capital T that means period of time that is, but we also have the capital T that means tension in the string. The capital T that I'm talking about right now, when I say when like the capital T in this context, like this capital T, that means tension in the string. So I'm trying to write it with serifs or something just to make that distinction, do whatever you want in your notes. But when I put the little funky serif things, I'm saying T meaning tension. Similarly, the mu Underneath it means density. It has nothing to do with friction or anything like that. That's what those things mean. But also similarly, we've got two Ks flying. Now you gotta be careful. Like, I'm sorry, this is the way it is. It's just super annoying, but it's true. K can mean the K of Hooke's law, like the stiffness of a string, a spring. And when I mean that, I just write K. But we also now have K meaning angular wave number number of radians per meter. Whenever I mean that K, I try to put serifs on that. Again, that's just like my dumb way of doing it. Do whatever you want in your notes, make it lowercase, whatever. Um, uh, but so right now, what it seems like I'm saying is angular frequency squared over angular wave number squared equals tension 
over mass density. That sounds hideously obscure, but we're going to keep unpacking this because it actually turns out to be super important. But this is my, so my conclusion so far is we've just in effect derived the wave equation two different ways. We derived it by just applying Newton's law to a plucked string, but we also derived it by taking partial derivatives of a cosine expression, which captures staggered oscillators. And by doing it both ways and getting the same thing, we've just found out that there's two different ways of writing a certain constant. That constant is the square of angular frequency over angular wave number, but that constant apparently also is tension over density. That's what I'm saying so far. Now that seems important enough that I want to investigate it further. In fact, I, I want to investigate it further. And in so doing, I want to remind everybody about omega and K. Omega, I feel like at this point, I hope people are sort of familiar with. Omega we've had since the beginning of the semester. It means angular fre frequency. I'll remind you again in a second. But I know K is still a little bit like yee for some people, many people. So let me unpack them both a little bit here because I want to relate them to tension and density. So, and again, this I'm sure I did not say Monday. So hopefully, even if I was just boring you or something like, like tune in now. Um, so I'm, my goal now is to unpack what I mean by omega squared over k squared. And in so do, and my, hope, my hope is to sort of find out why or how it can make sense that it would be in any way related to tension over mu. So, let, so first of all, angular frequency the thing that's measured in radians per second, it's how angular frequency was like for any one given oscillator, it was like how it was like wiggle rate, how quickly something was oscillating. Um, it was measured in radians because that's what the math pops out. But remember, there's two pi radians for every cycle. So one way of understanding angular frequencies, you could say like what's in the red box here, angular frequency is two pi over capital T for which when I write capital T like that, I'm both reminding you and trying to distinguish capital T written like that with no serifs or anything that has stood for period to us in this class. What do I mean by period? I mean the time for one cycle of here, right? Specifically speaking, like the units in which period are measured is seconds per cycle. Sec cycle isn't like really a unit, it's like a placeholder, but you know, so T is ultimately in seconds, but T, the period is measuring, is, is tracking how many seconds there are per cycle. Omega is tracking how many radians there are per second, right? The bridge between the two of them was, if you turn the page to the side, the bridge between the two was standard frequency F. Like if angular frequency was, was radians per second, lowercase f was pure cycles per second. And the conversion factor between the two was two pi. In other words, frequency, standard frequency is the straight up reciprocal of period. This is technically, this is a reminder, but just to remind you again, in other words, there's three ways to measure the, the, the wiggle rate of an oscillator. And if you know any one of the three, you automatically know the other two. They are three interchangeable, um, mutually, what's the word? Uh, they're like, they're ultimately the same information. It's three different ways to capture the same information. Again, if you know one, you automatically know the other two. But why do we have three? Because omega is the one that most explicitly comes out of the math and is the most explicitly direct and easy to use mathematically. Angular frequency is omega period on the other end of the spectrum is the most directly observable and measurable in the lab in experiments and therefore the most easy to picture in your mind. Remember again, please, if you ever think omega is like a little bit like, yeah, so does everybody. Omega is not physically intuitive. What's physically intuitive is how many seconds does it take for something to go back and forth? You can freaking measure it, whether it's a pendulum or a mass on a spring, just how many seconds does it take to go something back and forth? You can measure it, you can picture it. Well, if you flip that over in your mind, you get standard frequency, how many cycles does it make per second? And then if you multiply that by two pi, if you remember there's two pi radians in every cycle, then you get omega. So the, so, T is the most math, uh, physically and experimentally accessible 
omega is the most mathematically useful and F is like the bridge between the two. All of that technically is a reminder, but hopefully maybe it puts a little bit in perspective because now that's omega. That's just like my reminder of what the deal is with omega. Omega is measuring wiggle rate, but it's measuring it in radians per second. So ultimately omega is two pi over T. That's omega. Now K, K is exactly that idea, but for space rather than time. OK is how many cycles there are or how many radians there are per every unit of space rather than every unit of time. So, so it's so K, I'm, I'm obviously I'm going to flip the page in a second, but K is number of radians per unit length, not unit time. Specifically, it's the number of radians in every in, in the space of one full cycle. The time for one full cycle we call period T. The time for one full cycle we call period T. The space for one full cycle we have a name for and we have a symbol for, and you've seen it a million times in other areas of your life, I promise, in other science classes and like in sixth grade science and seventh grade science, and, but you've never seen it in lecture here before. So I just want to make it explicit. I'm going to make it explicit on the next page. But uh, let me say again, T period stands for number of, uh, sorry, T period stands for amount of time for a cycle, like amount of time that passes between the very first crest that passes you and the very second crest that passes you if some wave is passing you by. Well, what we also have a name for the amount of length, the amount of space the number of meters for one cycle, the number of meters that uh, is traversed between one crest and the very next crest, the amount of space for one cycle or the amount of length for one cycle is what's always called the wavelength. And it's usually designated with a lambda. You've seen this before in other classes, but now I'm saying now. So just like T is the um, size, is the time size of a cycle, Lambda is the space size of a cycle, the wavelength. Um, and so I'm saying right here, like lambda equals wavelength equals the distance for one cycle. It's measured, lambda is measured in units of meter per cycle, just like T was measured in seconds per cycle. And if you understand that, or if you even know that from chemistry or something else, then you can understand K by analogy as two pi over lambda. Like again, omega is measured in radians per second. It's the click rate in time. But K is the click rate in space, which makes no sense to talk about for an oscillator. There isn't one for an oscillator. But for a wave, there totally is. Just like you have to wait a certain amount of time for the next crest, there is a certain amount of space that is traversed between two crests. crests. So, so Omega is two pi over T. K is two pi over Lambda, where Lambda is wavelength, which is like what in hospitals and stuff they'll call like the peak to peak distance, right? And, but it could just as easily be the trough to trough distance or whatever. Okay, so I'm setting up a parallel here. Again, Omega is radians per second. K is radians per meter, like this page thing, right? Now, why am I saying, so that's just a, half remind you or clarify what omega and k are. And they are perfectly analogous. One is to time as the other is to space, like not a coincidence. And again, they're sort of both there in the cosine expression to emphasize that what a wave is, is cosinusoidal oscillations happening in time and in space together at one, right? So now I can say, oh, wait a second. If we know what omega is and we know what k is, I can, I can now put omega over k to figure, because remember we, like in one of these wave equations, we had this whole omega squared over k squared thing. So I want to look at what that means. If I put omega over k, well, then I'm putting two pi over t over two pi over lambda. And the two pi's cancel out. So I have one over t over one over lambda. And you know, when you divide by a fraction, you multiply by its reciprocal, like one divided by one fourth is four, because how many times does one fourth go into one? It goes 
four times. But so one divided by one fourth is the same as one times four, right? Like I know you know that, but that works both in the top and the bottom. So two pi over t over two pi over lambda is lambda over t, the number of meters per every cycle over the number of seconds per cycle. Uh, like the distance of a cycle over the time of a cycle. So what this is, what is omega over k, it very much is exactly what I hope you're thinking I'm thinking if you're listening at all. Like what omega over k is, is speed, right? I mean, is, 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 is v. Now let me pause, this is a big deal. This is a very big deal. Let me pause on this for a second. I'm saying, first of all, what I think we just proved or derived just by using definitions and just like rearranging them, I'm saying that this omega over k term that seems to have popped up as, as squared as the constant in our wave equation, omega over k, and again, I'm knowing that k is kind of a new obscure thing to many of us, but it's not that obscure once you look at it this way. Omega over k is the same thing as lambda over t, which now, don't forget, what is t? It's the reciprocal of f. Right, 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 like like period is the reciprocal of standard frequency or vice versa. So what I've written on the top here are three different ways, three equivalent ways of expressing the wave speed. The first way is, well, as it says here, like the very last way, lambda times F maybe even seems inconsistent. Like why would I, in other words, the wavelength times frequency is maybe a bizarre way to put it, but that's actually the way you will see this most, most commonly in other in textbooks, in other science classes, in P chem, in instrumental or whatever. In fact, sometimes you'll see C equals lambda F, where C is not just the speed of any old wave, but the speed of light. And that you know, assumes that light is acting like a wave when you do that. But you'll see this all over the place and for the rest of your life, like in almost any science you do, you'll see that V equals lambda F, or you'll see that C equals lambda F. And I'm telling you, just like, it, this is true for any wave speed V. V equals, oh, and sorry, most specifically, you'll really see it in the Doppler effect, if you didn't already, with Wu. Like he's going to be writing V equals lambda F all over the place in the, in the Doppler effect. V equals lambda F is a standard equation with regard to waves. It's true of any wave at all. Um, it's a way of getting the speed based on the wavelength and the frequency, but it actually makes sense when you think about it. It's just a shorthand way of saying speed equals distance per time. That's all it's saying. It's saying lambda over t or omega over k. It's just saying, it's just saying if, if, there's, if, if there's five meters between every pair of crests in this wave and you have to wait uh, two seconds between every pair of crests in this wave, then, this, then the wave is traveling five divided by two meters per second, two and a half meters per second, right? So first of all, that's a memorizer. Take that to the bank. Omega over k or lambda over t or lambda times f are all interchangeable ways of saying wave speed. The one on the right is the most common in all textbooks and in the Doppler effect context. The one in the middle, I think is the most intuitive. It's just showing you speed equals distance over time. The one on the left is the one that we need right now that I care about, like omega over k. It's probably the least obvious, but it's the one, but they all are interchangeable ways of saying speed. But let me also make clear before I go on and I, yeah, okay, we have 20 minutes. Oh, I can just kick back. No, no. Um, but we're, we're fine. Um, that all of these together equal V. Like I'm saying omega over K equals V, but by V, I literally, and for all time mean the propagation speed of the wave. Like again, remember if a, if a horizontal wave pulse if we're understanding it as a bunch of little vertic identical vertical oscillators, like a bunch of little masses on springs going like this, like all in a chart, or little water molecules going like up, down, up, down, water molecule, up, down, up, down, water molecule, up, down. And so then we get this ripple going like that, right? Then the V that I'm talking about, like then, then at any given moment, each one of these oscillators, you know, is speed is go back to the beginning of the semester like each one of these oscillators is like getting faster and faster as it approaches the equilibrium then it's getting slower and slower and then it's stopping then it's turning around getting faster and faster like each one of these has on the vertical on the transverse axis each oscillator has a continuously changing v like it has a derivative of a negative a omega sine omega t Right, and then it even has an acceleration, the derivative of that, and the accelerations are continuously changing. Like with each one of these oscillators on the transverse axis, speeds are doing all kinds of shifty 
continuously varying things. That's not the speed that I'm talking about here. I'm saying the speed at which the ripple propagates along the x-axis, the pulse, that speed is what I mean by lambda over t or omega over k or lambda times f. Like this is now not the speed of oscillation. This is not the speed of any individual thingy thing at any one instant. No, this is the propagation speed, the speed of the unthingy pulse itself. Okay, like the whole idea that we can see a pulse go across, like this goes back to the whole idea, like if I shout at you, I'm making sound waves that travel to you. The only thing that's moving at all between me and you, and again, forgetting the internet and all that, like pretending we were in the same room. If I shout at you and you hear me, the only thing moving at all between me and you is a bunch of air molecules, right? But no individual air molecule like is going from my mouth to your ear, I hope. I mean, that would be gross. Yet there is this pulse, this unthingy, abstract, immaterial, ethereal energy packet that manifestly goes manifestly goes from me to you. And it goes at a observable, measurable, predictable, reliable speed. Like in the case of sound, that speed is like 340 meters per second. That's the kind of speed I'm talking about here. This propagation speed, the unthingy thing speed, which from now on I'm gonna call V. That V from now on necessarily equals the lambda times the F or the omega over the K of, of the wave, okay? So, so first of all, it's sort of important. We've now just gotten wave speed. Um, um, but that's also interesting because if we now understand, if I've just like proven just by rearranging definitions that the V, the propagation speed of a wave is omega over K. Well, then like, like remember, we just got two, I, um, uh, we just got two formally equivalent wave equ equations to express the nature of a wave. And in one of them, we have omega squared over k squared. In other words, in one of them, we have v squared. But we said that the two constants, like if these two equations are really describing the same thing and they are identical equations, it's just they have different names for the constants inside. Well, then this must mean, right? I mean, these two things must be two different names. So for the same thing. So not only does t over mu apparently equal like omega squared over k squared, but apparently that means that t over mu equals v squared. Right, I'm saying this, like evidently if these two equal each other and these two equal each other, then these two equal each other. So I'm saying now, I'm saying now, uh, I wanna cover this up, I'm saying T over mu, where, ten, where T means tension and mu means density, that must equal V squared. I'll, be, you may, be, I'll go back to this page in a second, just, oh, yeah. So one thing before I even start analyzing, oh, did it? Here we go. Uh, I, I will go back in a second if you haven't copied that yet. I, I'll perp I apologize. But just one thing I'm saying now, we could put this together and the wave equation could be really tidily written. And this is the way you'll normally see in books. Like instead of choosing whether to write the constant as T over mu or as, what just happened? Did I just lose? Wait. Okay. Um, I'm saying that you could write the wave equation as, as that, as what's apparently on the screen right now, although I think it's about to disappear. Like, you could put in V squared instead of T over mu or omega over K and that squared. And that's kind of a big deal too, because now that means there's a whole lot, like every, oh, I knew that was gonna happen. Yeah, I just lost, okay, sorry, hold on one second. It's, that's such latency. I mean, I already lost it on my side, but okay, hold on a second. Um, yike, yike, yike. Hold on, the internet. Hold on. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I know we have 10 minutes. That will be fine if this comes back in a second, which it should. Come on. Oh. 
Okay. Um, okay. So one thing I'm saying now, now the entire, an entire wave pulse can be expressed in this one equation where we're saying at any given moment and in every single place, the acceleration of a piece of, of a piece of the wave must be directly proportional to the concavity of the medium at that point. And the constant of proportionality is the square of the rate at which the whole pulse propagates horizontally. Like everything you'd want to know about the wave is all packed into this one equation, which is kind of remarkable in itself, but much more to the point than that. What I'm saying is if we've just shown that V squared, here's what I think is the big deal. And we're, we are almost done with this, but if we've just shown that the speed, the propagation speed of the wave is squared is equal to tension divided by density, or in other words, that the speed is equal to the square root of tension divided by density. Well, that's a big deal because tension and density, like the sheet is trying to say here, they're parameters. They, the reason they're constants is that they are constant material properties of the medium. Like once you take your string and you fix it at both ends, then you know how tense it is, period. And once you say, okay, the string is this thick, then it's that thick. And that's not going to change while ripples go through it. Or similarly, if you say, I want to send sound through air and you specify air molecules that are at a certain temperature and a certain air pressure, then that's not going to change once you send ripples through. So that means that this is just like at the beginning of the year when we said omega is equal to square root of k over m, but k and m are material properties. They're parameters of the mass spring system. Thus, we said at the beginning of the year, frequency of an oscillator is independent of amplitude, we said. And I mean, I, that's a really big deal because that means once you set up your ingredients, once you put your spring there and you put your mass on it, it doesn't matter how you set them up. It doesn't matter if you bring the mass all the way out to here and let it go for really fast moving large swings, or you just pull it out to here and let it undergo small swings. They'll automatically be slow enough to compensate for how fast these things will be automatically. And no matter what amplitude you choose, you'll still get the same tick rate for an oscillator. We like angular fre frequency and period of an oscillator were dependent only on parameters. They were not dependent on initial conditions. Frequency was not dependent on amplitude. Hence, time cycles were existing independent of space. Hence, a clock, like a harmonic oscillator is a clock because the time does not get bogged down into the space. Now we're saying a deeper version of that. We're saying similarly, once you fix your medium, once you know that you're talking about this string, which is like this thick and this tense, or this air, which is like this hot and this pressurized, or like this water in the bathtub or this water in the lake, once you fix your medium, you automatically fix the speed at which pulses will propagate through that medium. You automatically fix the wave speed. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I'm almost done. You autom Once you fix the medium, you automatically fix the speed of the wave. And there's nothing you can do to change the speed of that wave unless you change the medium. That is a huge deal. That means number one, like, so if you think of speed of a wave as V equals lambda F, like I've written on the side here, like on the one hand, what I am saying is that means, I mean, if V equals lambda F, I'm saying something that sort of seems obvious, but sort of isn't, I think. It means when you're both standing, you know, at opposite ends of your string and like one of you is like shaking the string to send pulses, you can play with the frequency, right? Like you can shake the string really rapidly or you can shake the string really like, like slowly. But what you're changing when you change your shake rate is you're changing how many wave crests you send out per second. So you can send out a lot per second, you can make a high frequency wave, or you could send out very few per second, make a low frequency wave. But each one of those crests, the minute it comes out and starts moving, it's gonna move at one and only one speed through that medium. So that if you make a higher frequency wave, you automatically make a smaller wavelength, like if you if F goes up automatically, lambda goes down, higher frequency waves will be lower wavelength waves, like smaller waves. And you might even say, well, like, duh, yes, I understand inverse proportionality. Thank you, Yavram. You're like, yeah, if the F goes up, the lambda goes down. And I've done that in chemistry before, like, no, duh. 
Well, it's, it's no duh, but it isn't no duh. Because think about F equals MA for a minute. Same type of equation, like three variables, like linearly related to each other, F equals MA, right? Well, with F equals MA, you say, if A goes up, M goes down, yes, they're inversely proportional. Oh my God, hold on a second, sorry, hold on one second. Right. Yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming, wait, is someone on the floor? Oh my God, like this couldn't, all right, sorry, that was a total interruption in like my most dramatic like moment ever. All right, uh, and I know we have four minutes now and I totally apologize. Like, it was a bottle of wine being delivered to my apartment, which would you think, you'd almost think like, well, that's worth it, isn't it? Except it totally wasn't for us, it was for our neighbors, but okay. Um, uh, 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 uh. See, I'm totally, okay. Oh yeah, like F equals M, and I have to, and I, I know it's 416, but this is a really, look at that point. F equals MA. It's easy to think in a way like, yeah, with M goes up, A goes down, but that's assuming F is held constant, right? Like, yes, if I push a light thing and I push the same amount on a heavy thing, yeah, the light thing will accelerate more and the heavy thing will accelerate left, less. That's assuming I hold F constant, then if M goes up, A goes down, but there's no law that says I have to do that. I could just as easily apply that equation and do a different experiment. I could hold M constant and I could say that F is directly proportional to A, right? If I look at two identical bricks and I push one harder, it will accelerate more, right? So F and A are directly proportional. M and A are inversely proportional. It totally depends on which one you choose to hold constant. With waves, we're saying there's no choice. The reason that when lambda goes up, F goes down and vice versa is because V is always constant for a wave. This is a big deal. Waves don't accelerate, period. And well, more than that, put another way, if you ever go, and I'm not just talking approximately, I'm talking exactly and in reality, like drop a rock in a pond or like in the bathtub, like just make ripples, look at those ripples or any picture or any movie of ripples. One thing that everybody unconsciously knows, but no one consciously necessarily thinks about is you never see a ripple catch up to another ripple. Right, the gaps between the ripples remain constant because all the freaking ripples travel at the same speed as each other and for all time through that medium. There's no acceleration ever to worry about in a wave and there's no difference in velocities. Once you fix the medium, the speed is fixed. That's why we can talk about something like the speed of sound. Whereas we never talk about the speed of a baseball, there's no such thing. Oh, 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 sorry. Cool, cool. I'm totally psyched. Thank you. And it wasn't even the wine. So good. But right, no, like that's really, really a thing about waves. And even though I only have two minutes, it gets even weirder than that. But right, that's the first important point is fix the is fix the fix the medium and you fix the speed of the wave. Say air at standard temperature and pressure, and you can say, oh, well, sound will travel through it at 340 meters per second. End of story, right? That's already a big, but now the last thing, and I know there's one minute. Let's go even further. Remember, all speed, all speeds are relative. All velocities are relations between two objects, right? Like I'm going at a zero speed relative to the Earth, but the Earth is going 65,000 miles an hour relative to the Sun. Add the two together, and you get that I'm going 65,000 miles an hour relative to the Sun. And both facts are true; they're not in contradiction. It just speed is a comparison. It depends what you're comparing it to, right? Always, always. Now that's still true of wave speeds. Speeds are still relative always to something. With a wave, what I'm saying is their speed, so this is this sentence here, it's not just that the medium fixes the speed, but it fixes it relative to the medium. So if, and so, and I know I have one minute, and if you have to go, go, but this is totally worth hearing, and this is where I'm gonna end. But like, like, like what this really means that's so crazy, and this is the thing underlying the Doppler effect is, is like if I, and. Again, forgive me, if you have to go, just go. I think, okay, so it's 420, I'm gonna be, this is like one minute, but if I stand on, uh, if I stand on a train and I throw a 75 mile an hour baseball pitch, like 75 miles an hour relative to my hand, right? But I'm standing on a train that's going 100 miles an hour past y'all. 
then if you're standing on the platform and this, then you, then the ball is going to go 175 miles an hour relative to you, right? Like that's not supposed to be a surprise. It's just the deal, right? Because if I was holding the ball still, so it's zero relative to me, it would be going 100 miles an hour relative to you. But I throw it at 75, so to you, 75 to me. So it goes 175 to you. That's not most meant to be a surprise, but put another way, you don't expect me to catch up to the ball just because I'm on a train, right? Like the ball gets the speed of the train, just like I do, right? So it's always staying 75 miles ahead of me every hour. And it's staying 175 miles ahead of you every hour. Here's what I'm saying though. Sound doesn't do that. Waves don't do that. If I shout off the train, Right? If I shout off the train, the sound comes out of my mouth and is immediately going 340 meters per second relative to the air, not relative to me, not relative to the source, not relative to the train, to the air. So if I'm crashing through, the, and that means if you're standing in the air, then the sound is going 340 meters per second relative to you. But if I'm moving through that air while it's doing that, well, then it's not going 340 meters per second relative to me, meaning I can catch up to the sound. You cannot catch up to a baseball that you threw. No matter how fast you're going, the baseball is just gonna go that much faster. But you can, if I'm on a train or better, an airplane and the airplane starts approaching the speed of sound, then I will start approaching the sound. And if the airplane literally goes at the speed of sound, then I will catch up and be with the sound next to me. Like all the high pressure packets of air will be piling up next to me and we'll all be traveling together. And the minute I accelerate through that, I've cra I have literally moved through a wall of sound that I created and I'll go through it and that's a sonic boom. And if I slammed on the brakes now and went and like slowed down and the sound came back to me, it would come back backwards, just like logic would dictate. Like that's how weird waves are. You literally can catch up to them, go through them, come back through them because they don't go at a speed that's dependent on the source. They go at a speed that's dependent on the medium medium. That's all. Um, thank you for waiting. Thank you for, um, you know, being patient. That's all you need to, that's the Doppler effect. Okay. Well, see, so goodbye. Sorry to go overboard. We will talk more on Monday. If I can get a goodbye, then I will say goodbye. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> I was hoping, I just looked, thank you. That's awesome. But seriously, okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, awesome, awesome. Goodbye, bye, have a great week. I owe you, thank you, goodbye. Thank you, bye. Well